ברוכים הבאים, ערב טוב. אני מבקש מכולם לכבות, לוודא שהפלאפונים שלהם מחובים, שקטים. ההרצאה היום היא באנגלית, ולכן אני אציג את האורח ב- באנגלית. Uh, so good evening, welcome everybody to a lecture in the series we called uh, Shomu Shamaim Darwin Birushalaim, which translates to good heavens, Darwin is in Jerusalem, which is very relevant to your talk. And uh, so uh, last uh, month uh, we had uh, Guy, Professor Guy Bloch, talking about the evolution of the social system, especially in bees, and everyone who attended this talk realized how complex and fascinating is this uh, topic. And today we are delighted and very honored to host a distinguished uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, Professor Francisco Ayala, And uh, Professor Ayala is uh, hosted by the Della Pergola chair, uh, held by uh, Professor Yav Kabanchik, and therefore Yoav is going to present to you Professor Ayala. ערב טוב לכולם, <coughs> ברשותכם אני גם אעבור לאנגלית, אם כי אני לא בטוח כלל וכלל שהאורח שלנו לא יודע קצת עברית. I, what I said just now that I'm not absolutely certain that you do not understand Hebrew at all, because in your training you must have been exposed to Hebrew at some point. So, the person that we have here today Professor Francisco Ayala is a professor of biology at the University of California at Irvine. He originally is from Madrid, where he graduated from the Pontifical Faculty in Theology. And if I remember correctly, in 1961, he moved to the United States where he studied genetics at Columbia University and then trained at the Rockefeller Institute. And from the Rockefeller Institute, he moved to California, initially at Davis and subsequently at Irvine, where he holds the professorship of biological sciences. However, he is also professor of philosophy, of theology, and several others cathedrals he's holding at the university. So, This person that has been awarded with many awards and medals for his contribution to science and to humanity has been coined by the New York Times as the Renaissance scientist of evolutionary biology. Among other things, he has been he's a member of the Academy of Sciences of the United States since 1981. He has been president of the AAAS, past president, He has been in very important committees that dealt with questions related to evolution, teaching, etc. He has published numerous papers, both in basic science, particularly on genetic problems related to evolution. He has published several books, very important books, like Human Evolution, Darwin's Gift to Science and Religion, Darwin and Intelligent Design, etc. So not for nothing he was mentioned, he was coined with the name a Renaissance, a scientist of the year. Now, among other things, being a true Renaissance person, he was a lover of opera, I discovered, and he has been a part of the board of the Opera Pacific and Pacific Symphony, based in Oran County. Among other hobbies, or perhaps not hobbies, maybe there's an additional uh, asset to that, he is also Uh, interested in wine and he seems to have vineyards that together with his wife he's been running and they've been, produ- they have been producing grapes for many wineries in California. So a true person of the Renaissance. 
Now, regarding the topic of today, Copernicus and Darwin, two revolutions, and perhaps the name revolution is perfect because perhaps these people were not revolutionists, but they created revolutions. So, if I may say a word about it, as Sigmund Freud put it in the work of these two scientists, forced humanity to endure two great outrages upon its naive self-love. The first outrage was sparked by Copernicus, but it was taken seriously only after Galileo's observation. And this is that the Earth is not special, it's merely one of several planets that are orbiting a, a much larger sun. The first outrage, okay, was sparked by Copernicus. But the second outrage is that mankind is not special. And we are part of the animal kingdom, as Darwin put it, one small tweak on the vast tree of life. So it's hardly a surprise that the work of both men was perceived in some circles, at least, as a grave threat to the established order, as most revolutions are. And finally, Perhaps there is a line connecting here between Copernicus, Galileo, and Darwin that were educated to be priests but opted for entertaining themselves otherwise. I discovered, we discovered ironically, that our special guest has followed more or less a similar path. So please, let's give a warm welcome to our distinguished professor, Ayala, speaker of today. Thank you, uh, Professors Kavanchik and Ratan, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I was in Jerusalem for the first and only time, I think it was either 92 or 93, at the time I was able to spend several days, almost a week, gave several lectures, the memorial one and some more sp specialized ones and I had the opportunity to visit much of Israel, courtesy of uh, my scientist hosts. But I'm very happy to be here again. So thank you for the invitation, thank you for the presentations. This is the painting known as Guernica by Pablo Picasso. Guernica is, was a small town, about 7,000 people in the Basque country of Spain. In uh, 23 of April of 1837, early in the Spanish Civil War, uh, Nazi airplanes under the command of General Franco bombed the city and killed 25% of the inhabitants, about 1,300 women, children, and men. It was not a military target of any sort. Um, the reason to bomb this city is because the Basques were not supporting the revolution of Franco, and this town is considered the spiritual home of the Basques. Well, we would all agree that this painting was painted to uh, convey a message. It was designed for a purpose. It was designed by a painter an intelligent creator, uh, to convey the message in, in humanity of man to man, you know, the brutality of war. And in the same way that I think we would agree that the watch is designed to tell time and that a car is designed for transportation. These are the letters of the alphabet of the Greek, English alphabet um, and the digits. They are butterfly wings. Now we could use these letters to write English text and we could yeah, use the numbers to do arithmetic calculations, but I suspect you would agree with me that these were not designed, these butterfly wings, to write text or to do calculations in the same way that we can use a mountain for a skiing, or we can use a, a boat for transportation on the rivers, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean that. I say we can use a mountain for, for uh, skiing, all the rivers for navigation, but the rivers are not designed for the purpose of humans using them for navigation, or the mountain has not been designed for a skiing. Well, what about the human eye? Um, the great discovery of Darwin is that the human eye has something in common with the painting and with the car and with the watch and something in common with the butterfly wings and the mountain and the river. What it has in common with the um, painting is if it were not for the purpose it serves, namely vision, the eye would never have come to exist. So it exists, it has been designed for a purpose. But what it has in common with the butterfly wings and the mountain and the river is that it is not the result of an intentional design, but it is the result of a natural process. And this is what is going to be the content of my lecture, uh, trying to um, convey to you that, that this Darwin's greatest discovery. There can be the sign without the signer. With this discovery, Darwin brought living organisms, the adaptations and the diversity of living organisms within the realm of science that had been left out by the Copernican Revolution. So here we have Nikolai Copernicus, who in the year of his death, in 1543, published this book on the revolutions of the celestial bodies, um, where he argues that the Earth is not the center of the universe, as it was commonly thought at the time, but it's just one more planet revolving around a star, the sun. This is from a German text, contemporary of the year of the publication of Copernicus book, the year of his death, where it has the earth and the moon around the earth in the center, and then it has Mercury, Venus, then the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the constellations of the stars, the universe as it was known then. At that time, and for the ensuing two centuries, all scientific books were lit, written in Latin. So this book was in Latin, and, she was, and so it was Copernicus. But here we have a drawing by Copernicus. Now he has the sun in the middle, correctly, Mercury, Venus, the Earth with the moon, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the stars. Well, the narrative of history of ideas that speaks of Copernicus' revolution and also speaks of the Darwinian revolution, says the great revolution of Copernicus is remove the Earth from being the center of the universe to being just one more planet around an average star. In fact, we know that the sun is one of a hundred thousand million stars that exist in our galaxy, and that there are about a hundred thousand million galaxies. So the Earth is not the center of the universe, but in some respects, just a little speck there in the immensity of a space. Of a space. Similarly, this narrative of the history of ideas says that Darwin's revolution consisted in removing humans from being the center of life around which all of life has been created, all animals and all plants, for the purpose of serving humans, and making humans just one more species uh, that was accomplished uh, by the origin of a species, which was published in 1859 to 150 years ago, as of last year, as of last November. And here we have, in a modern representation, this idea that where we see that humans are very closely related to the chimpanzees and to the other apes and, of course, to all the other animals and plants and the rest of life. Just one species and among more than two million species that live now and one that came about very recently. Well, this 
narrative of the history of ideas is very unsatisfactory in my view, not because what it says is wrong, but because it misses what is most important about the two revolutions. What is significant about the Copernican Revolution, what is most significant, has to be in the context of a few of the great scientists that came over the next century or century and a half, including these two which I have highlighted because are probably the most distinguished among the many that could be mentioned, Galileo, who died almost exactly 100 years after Copernicus, and Newton, who curiously was born the year Galileo died. Well, what was significant about the Copernican revolution seen in the context of these additional scientists is the beginning of science in the modern sense. The notion that the world consists of matter in motion governed by natural laws, that these laws are simple, can be formulated in simple ways with equations, uh, are universal in application on Earth as well as in the heavens, and they can be tested by observation and experiment. Simple equations, well, there is Galileo, there is Newton, like force equal mass times acceleration, or the law of uh, inverse square distance law of attraction that says that the attraction between two bodies is directly proportional to the product of their masses, but inversely related to the square of their distance. The Copernican Revolution had left out the organisms and have left them out for a general understanding. He goes through the Western tradition, starting already with Greeks, the Greeks of classical Greece, and, and coming all the way down to the 19th century um, and, and uh, certainly into the times of Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, that said that organisms give clear evidence of the sign, and where is the sign? There is a designer. And the argument has been elaborated in great detail by William Paley, who published in 1802 Natural Theology. William Paley was an Anglican priest, British Anglican, very well known as an author of some books of theology um, and ethics that were textbooks that Darwin, when he was student in Cambridge, had to study and pass exams about them. But he was known mostly as a public speaker for evolution, for abolition. He was um, uh, completely committed to the idea that the slavery had to be eradicated from the United Kingdom and eventually from elsewhere. So he had a, a life as a public speaker. In 1800, 1800, became ill and decided to study biology and summarize his um, studies, his understanding of biological processes in this book, Natural Theology, that he published in 1802, where he argues again and again uh, that parts of organisms, uh, our limbs, our organs, the organism as a whole, give clear evidence of having been designed for specific purposes. And one of his examples, the best known, although he has many, is the human eye. You know, he points out that it does not do any good to have a, a, a retina if you don't have also a lens and a cornea and an iris and a nerve to transmit the information from the retina to the brain, and so on for all other organs of humans. And he goes through animals and through plants and the relationships between them and repeats the argument again and again, a beautifully written book, that, uh, about 350 pages long. Well, it was the genius of Darwin to discover that one could explain the sign, the design of organisms, without having to have recourse to an external agent, to a creator or some other supernatural or preternatural uh, entity, 
but rather that organisms and their organs, their parts, their adaptations could be explained as the result of natural processes under the um, dominance, as it were, of one particular law, natural selection, although, of course, the theory is much more complex than just natural selection. The concept of natural selection is very simple. Um, Darwin had gone, after graduating from Cambridge in 1831, he went on a five-year trip in a ship of the British Navy, who was commissioned to um, define better the coasts of particularly southern South America and some of the islands of the Pacific. And in this trip, uh, Darwin made considerable observations of faunas and floras in South America, very different from the ones in Europe. He discovered major fossils and studied fossils of uh, organisms that didn't exist any longer, and made many other observations. When he came back in 1836, after five years in the HMS Beagle, he decided he was going to try to understand how these organisms and their adaptations come about. Darwin is often credited with the theory of evolution, and that's correct. He provided more evidence and more convincing evidence about evolution that existed at the time. But the theory is not new with him. Evolution was accepted by a majority of biologists by the middle of the 19th century, and already the year in which Darwin was born, a French zoologist, Lamarck, had published a book about evolution. And, and so were many other writings about evolution and frequent acceptance by scientists, by biologists in general. But the evolution was discussed without, without um, providing an explanatory mechanism, a law that will be consistent, say, with the laws that have been discovered by the physicists. So evolution was there. Darwin writes in his early notebooks, which he, he started to keep right after returning from, from the HMS Beagle trip. He kept numerous notebooks where he wrote in detail, in great detail, all his ideas, all his impressions, his reactions to readings, his observations. And one of the first things that he writes, what is the point of getting more evidence of evolution, or for evolution, since we don't know how it happens? What is important is that we understand how evolution proceeds. And, yes, in, and yet, in less than two years, before the end of 1838, he writes in the notebooks, his concept of natural selection, and he realizes he has made a major discovery. And he records it, and he says, here I have a theory to work with. What I have to do now is to test and to um, see whether the, my theory is correct in explaining the diversity of organisms and their adaptations. And he refers from there on to the end of his life to the theory of natural selection as my theory. He never says of evolution, my theory. Evolution was there. What was important was the discovery of the mechanism, the process by which evolution occurred. And here is one uh, short paragraph from chapter three of the origin of a species. The origin of a species, as you may have noticed, the title is the origin of a species by means of natural selection. Darwin thought of this book as a summary of a multi-volume book that he was writing, which will be entitled Natural Selection, which is why he didn't entitle The Origin of a Species Natural Selection, although he put it on the title, The Origin of a Species by Natural Selection. And he dedicates the first eight chapters to, the, to explain natural selection, and then goes into the evidence for evolution and dedicates two chapters to geology and paleontology, 
two chapters to our geography, one chapter to what we now call comparative anatomy and embryology, and in chapter 14 he comes back to summarize his theory of natural selection. When he is present dedicated five chapters that he has of evidence for evolution, he's just not showing evolution alone. He's showing evolution by natural selection because he again and again shows that evolution doesn't happen like Lamarck and uh, eventually Chambers, an author of 1844 in England, and his own contemporary, which I will say a few words about in a moment, Wallace, that they thought evolution was organisms changing gradually one step at a time and becoming more advanced, more progressive. Uh, Darwin says, no, if evolution is by natural selection, that is not how it happens. It should happen by organisms changing in some places in one direction, the same organisms in other places in other direction because the environmental conditions are different, and some parts of the organism of an animal species changing at one time, others not changing at all or changing later. So a very completely, a completely different uh, model of evolution than what was generally accepted by his fellow biologists. And he has these chapters saying evolution occurs, but occurs according to natural selection. And the key point about natural selection is very simple, is that he says, we know from the practice of farmers and animal breeders that variations occurred that are beneficial to humans. It stands to reason that similar variations useful to each being in the great and complex battle of life should sometimes occur. And if such do occur, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? So he says variations occur. We know that from the practice of farmers and animal breeders, but variations, some of these variations should be, stands to reason, beneficial to the organisms themselves. And that means those who have beneficial variations are going to live more progeny and therefore their variations are going to spread and organisms will change that way. But again, not changing in all relevant respects and in a continuous manner. For that reason, I, among the few evolutionists uh, that uh, you may have heard, uh, I often say to be um, a little um, uh, contrarian that Alfred Russell Wallace which every book on evolution or history of biology tells you that discovered natural selection independently. I said Wallace did not discover natural selection as the explanation of adaptation of organisms. In the letter that he wrote to Darwin in 1858, and there was published some other brief statements of Darwin about evolution by natural selection, Wallace it's a, it's a five pages uh, article. It's a very short, it's a letter that he asked Darwin to read. And if you, Mr. Darwin, think that these are good ideas, please make sure they get published. And Darwin got them published. They were presented at a meeting in London in July 1, 1858, with a title for the three pieces, the one from Wallace and two short ones uh, from Darwin with the general title of Wallace's own paper, which was on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type, instability of varieties supposed to prove the permanent distinctness of a species. What he is arguing there is, and what he believed in, is that the species are changing continuously, are progressing continuously, and natural selection is what eliminates the harmful things and accumulates the good things so that they can become, in, they become more and more progressive. Completely different from the use of the theory by, of natural selection by Darwin and how Darwin develops the concept, including, as I have said a moment ago, that Darwin does not think that organisms necessarily progress or advance. He says they change, but they don't change all the parts of the organisms uh, simultaneously or more or less in, in congruence the different ones at different times. Um, so the evidence for evolution 
um, comes uh, as Darwin presented it uh, in two chapters from geology and paleontology. And here I have an example of what uh, had become generally accepted during the first half of the 19th century, namely that the strata that are found where uh, the earth gets exposed are, have uh, come about as deposits, usually in the bottom of the ocean, uh, over time. That means that when we look at the strata, this is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River in the United States, about one mile from the river to the top, and about one billion years of evolution. Since the fossils that are found in the lower levels had lived earlier than the ones who are higher and higher and higher, and that allows us to see evolution, uh, how it uh, occurs, and, and the succession of organisms. And so evolutionary lines of descent were constructed like this one of the horse. This is a modern drawing where, starting about 55 million years ago, there was a small horse about the size of a, of a medium-sized dog today. And at some point, there were many species. We evolutionists often represent evolution through time as a tree with branches. The origin of a new species is a new branch. Uh, notice that uh, most species become extinct, and that was one of Darwin's point. If evolution is by natural selection, most species will become extinct over time, and others will change in different ways and different times, and in the case of the horse, it's not only size, but the number of toes, and many other things change. Um, contemporaries of Darwin, and in some cases up to the present, say, well, if evolution is gradual and changes occur from one kind of organism to the another, where are the missing links? And here you have a missing link which was discovered in Darwin's time, two years after the publication of The Origin of a Species in 1861, and the Darwin incorporated in the later editions of The Origin of a Species. is known as Archaeopteris, is a fossil found in, um, in what is today Bavaria, which has clearly some traits, including like the long tail and most of the skeleton, typical of a dinosaur, small dinosaur, because this animal was about the size of a crow, relatively small, but has feathers and has a beak very much like a mother bird. And by now, 10 fossils of this particular organism has been found, and very recently, in the last couple of months, it has been published another missing link a little earlier than Archaeopteris, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on it. Here is the photograph of the real fossil, and here the reconstruction, and again, traits of have been a bird and traits of being a reptile, clearly an intermediate, and this is a reconstruction, an artistic re reconstruction of this species recently discovered, as, as I have said. Um, well, very recently, also not as recent as that, but about five years ago, was discovered a critical intermediate between fish and amphibians, between animals living on the ocean and um, tetrapods, the animals that eventually, the vertebrates that lived on Earth. Um, that was this animal tiktalic. Up to that point, these two species were known that were showing some traits in the brain and otherwise characteristic of amphibians. They were still clearly fish predominantly. Then there were these other organisms known that had some characteristic of fish but had already limbs, clear limbs, and they could walk. And um, the, this Acanthostega, this animal, lived about 370 years ago. Panderectis 380. So a group of scientists of the University of Chicago said, well, so the intermediate between the two must have lived about 375 million years ago. We, we know a couple of places 
on Earth where there are fossil deposits from that time, and they spent several years in the Inuit territory of northern Canada and eventually unearthed this creature that they call Tiktaalik, which is as intermediate as it can be between fish and amphibians, already starting to show the structure of the forelimbs and the legs as we have them now. Of course, the kind of um, missing links that mattered most to Darwin's contemporary and contemporaries and, and matters today for those who are skeptical concerns humans. If we have evolved from ancestors that were not humans, uh, we are closely related to the chimpanzees and gorillas through the succession of ancestors. Where are the intermediates between our ape ancestors and modern humans? And Darwin died without any one such intermediate fossil having been discovered, although he was convinced that eventually it will be discovered. And um, eventually, indeed, uh, a few years, uh, seven years after the death of Darwin in 1889, and then again in 1891, a Dutch physician, uh, an amateur paleontologist, discovered what now we call Homo erectus in Java. He called it Pithecanthropus erectus. Um, he was enough of an anatomist as a physician to know that this animal, this creature was bipedal, erectus, an erect gait, but he had, he had other features more similar to monkeys, to apes. The piteco is uh, the root for, for um, ape or for monkey, and pithecanthropus, anthropus is the root for men, and both of them in Greek, so pithecanthropus, ape, human, erect. Uh, and since then, um, particularly after the discovery of this creature called Australopithecus afarensis by a group of scientists of the University of California in Berkeley uh, 35 years ago, almost precisely, there has been a tremendous inversion uh, of funds by governments and foundations and the like looking for uh, human fossils, hominids, as the intermediates that from the ancestor, which is ancestor of the chimpanzees as well as ancestor to us. From the time that their lineage going to human separates from the lineage of the chimpanzees to the present, these ancestors are called, or were called hominids. Now they're called hominins. But be that as it may, by now thousands of fossils have been discovered. Here you have in millions of years when they lived, this between seven and six million years ago, and so on. Uh, what these um, scientists of Berkeley did, something that some of us didn't appreciate at the time, but worked out very well, is that they knew how to manipulate the media. And they make a big spectacle uh, out of the discovery of um, Australopithecus afarensis, which was about 40% of the skeleton of a young woman and started by calling her Lucy and referring to Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds, the song of the Beatles that was so popular. And from there on, all of it was a media show which was very effective, eventually and attracted yeah, money for research in anthropology, in paleoanthropology, and now indeed we have many fossils. And one thing that happens, and again, this is what Darwin had said would, should happen, is that the bipedal gait appears very early in, in the evolution of the hominids, while the brain, which is the other major distinction, the most obvious distinction with the apes, we have a brain which is four times larger than that of a, of a chimpanzee and three and a half times larger than that of a gorilla, um, the, the bipedal gait appears very early in the hominids but the brain starts to change only about two million years ago with Homo habilis, which is, you see the, the bar here that represents Homo habilis, and then it starts to increase at a tremendous pace. It increases by a factor of three in two million years, which in evolutionary terms is very, very fast. 
But as, again, what Darwin had said, that some things will change at one time, some at other time, depending on the circumstances. And we have now a fair understanding what, why the brain was not changing early on and why it started to change at some point and ch change it so fast. But there's uh, something I will not say now. To persuade you, um, since like me, probably most of you are not good anatomists, uh, that Lucy was a bipedal. Here is the bones that were discovered, and this is uh, her hip bone. Uh, there's the, the pelvis, the hip bone of Lucy, enlarging size because Lucy was a small creature of about uh, a little more than a meter tall, perhaps. I have enlarged it to compare in shape with the modern human, and this is the, the hip bone of a gorilla and, or a chimp, and it's clear that with a hip like that, like the one we have, and the one that Lucy had, that she could not walk the way apes walk, which is knuckle walking, resting on the knuckles. Um, well, Darwin used comparative anatomy and pointed, points out, as we can point out today, the fact that as a consequence, as a consequence of being ourselves directed, di direct descendants of Tiktaalik, Tiktaalik was not discovered, but the, the explanation, we all have all the um, terrestrial vertebrates, forearm limbs that are made up of the same bones, organized in the same way, um, and clearly derived from an ancestor, we have a similar set of bones. So the whale uses f that structure for the forearm limb for swimming, a dog for running, a bird uh, f uh, for flying, and we use it for manipulating objects, writing, and, and yet we are, uh, the bones are structured in the same way, clearly derived from a common ancestor, which is what accounts for their similarities. So there was convincing evidence uh, for evolution, and I will say a few words in a few moments about uh, um, biogeography, which was the other source of evidence used by Darwin. But something happened within the last half century, and is the advent of molecular biology. Molecular biology science that didn't exist in Darwin's time turns out to provide a, the strongest evidence for evolution, assuming that we needed more evidence for evolution to occur, and also the one that provides the most detailed information about the ancestry, the evolution, and the processes by which living organisms um, originated. We cannot do molecular biology, at least not yet, with fossils that lived more than 30 or 40,000 years ago. But studying living organisms, we can reconstruct the evolutionary history in great detail. I'm going to um, point out that molecular evolution proves molecular biology is evidence for evolution for the same reasons that comparative anatomy. If we look at the proteins in all organisms on Earth, from bacteria to fungi to plants to animals, all the fundamental molecules of the process of life, which are enzymes, which are a kind of proteins and proteins, all are made of the same components. The only way to explain that is the same way which we explain the similar bone structures for the terrestrial vertebrates. The original life from which all living organisms derive had these 20 amino acids and we all have inherited them from them. We all have the same molecule of heredity, DNA, the famous double helix, and the same dictionary. This is the dictionary that translates from DNA to proteins. Identical in, in all organisms. Imagine uh, you were to discover dictionaries where the equivalent between the words are the same in two books. Clearly, those two books could not have independent origin. They, have, they must have been derived one from the other or both from the, uh, an equal ancestor. Briefly, the first demonstration of how useful is molecular biology to reconstruct evolutionary history. In 1967, in the journal Science, two scientists, Emmanuel Margolias, a biochemist, and Walter Fitch, an evolutionist uh, who at the time was a young professor 
in the University of Wisconsin. Now he's a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, where I am also in Irvine. They studied this protein precisely because it was very small. At that time, the methods didn't exist to study large proteins. It didn't exist for studying DNA. Today, what I'm going to show you, we do it much better, much more efficiently, much less cost by getting sequence of the letters of DNA. But at this time, they have to work on the letters, so to speak, the components of proteins. And cytochrome C is a protein that consists of 100 amino acids in these three organisms shown here. That is the first one. And if you go through the top line, the last one is this amino acid, uh, glutamic acid. There's glutamine and, and so some of the other 20. When we compare this sequence of amino acids with that of monkeys, it is found that the letters are all the same in all places except one difference. And when they are compared with a horse, then there are either 11 or 12 differences. Well, we already knew that horses are less closely related to humans than monkeys are, but this would have prove, proven that in, in any case. But the point here is not to demonstrate the that, that, uh, evolutionary history of these three organisms, but how molecular biology is used by aligning sequence of letters, amino acids in the case of proteins, DNA in the case of or, or nucle uh, uh, nucleotides in the case of DNA, and then counting the number of difference. One of the advantages of the method is that it's very simple and very precise. Just count differences. As in this case, one can then say, well, from human to monkey, one difference, human to horse, 12, monkey to horse, 11. It's clear that the evolutionary history of these three organisms must have been a remote ancestor going to the horse and to the ancestor of monkey and humans, and moreover, the difference between humans and monkeys occurred in the human lineage, and that we know because the, the, the difference does not exist between monkeys and humans. So they look at 20 organisms going from yeast to humans, and got the sequences now represented each amino acid for one let, by one letter. They built a matrix, the list of the differences, fed it to a computer, and the computer gave them this tree. This is a model drawing, actually a model drawing, um, largely originated from me, from the Encyclopedia Britannica. I have been for the last 25 years the author of the uh, article on, in the Encyclopedia Britannica on, on evolution, say 30 or 40 pages of the big book. But, but this is the same uh, narrative, graphic narrative that they had. Uh, a common ancestor going one branch to the yeast, the other one to the animals, another split here, one to the insects, the other one to the vertebrates. Now, this reconstruction done by this small molecule is not correct in all relevant respects, but is nearly accurate. And of course, we study more and more genes or more and more proteins when we want to, to uh, get more accuracy. Uh, but the amazing thing is that such a tiny protein from such a small gene allows allow to reconstruct 2,000 million years of evolutionary history. So that's the power of molecular biology. And now we have reconstructed the history of all the living world, start, starting from the universal common ancestor to bacteria, archaea, another kind of microscopic organisms, and eukaryotes, which include us, the animals, plants, and fungi. Well, let me say, a couple of words to, about natural selection, and then I will come uh, to back to the arguments of William Paley in their present version. The way natural selection is, uh, uh, is described is that it's a response to the conditions of the environment. Variations that are useful to organisms in those particular situations will be if they are beneficial, they will be multiplied. So here you have Biston betularia, otherwise known as the peppered moth. Here it is, the peppered moth. A variation occurs, a mutation, that makes it black. Well, up to 1850, many collections of these moths that exist in Great Britain, 
there is not a single black moth. Around 9, 1850, the first black moth appears in a collection, and ever since the number of black moths, the frequency increases considerably. How come? Well, how come the Industrial Revolution and the use of coal in factories, which had killed the lichens that covered the trees, had covered them with soot, and now the black mutant, the melanic form as it is known, is the one which is less visible. The main predators of these moths are birds. So when birds look for a good dinner, obviously they see the peppered moth very obviously, much less easy to see the black moths. So now they are eating those and the black moths are propagating because they have an advantageous and, uh, change. That, by the way, has been reversed as a consequence of uh, the control of pollution in Great Britain. But the best place to, one of the best places to study evolution are remote archipelagos, because remote archipelagos have been colonized by very few organisms. Most evolution occurs in the large continents, and from these large continents, some organisms make it to the remote archipelagos. None is as isolated as Hawaii, about 2,000 miles from where I work, from Southern California. And we have all these islands that have all been formed here, where the Kilauea volcano is active now. And when the volcano is spitting stuff from the center of from the Earth to the surface, if eruption continues for enough time, eventually the accumulation of material crosses the surface of the ocean, and you have an island. And that's how these islands are formed. But there is another factor which explains their arrangement, and is that these islands are standing in a tectonic pla plate, the North Pacific tectonic plate, which is moving at a rate of two inches per year northwesterly. So the islands are formed here, and they are moving that way. And of course, when there is a period without eruptions, you have then new islands. And when in, a lot of eruptions are interrupted, but not long enough, you end with situations like the big island of Hawaii, where we have um, several volcanoes, the Hokala Mountains, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, and now Kilauea. But that's how all these um, um, volcanoes and these islands have been formed. When one looks at the diversity of organisms in Hawaii, the native flora and fauna that is before humans started to bring all sorts of other creatures there, many strange things happen. One, for example, is Drosophila flies, the flies that we geneticists use in the laboratory to do experiments because they are very easy to breed and inexpensive. There are 2,000 species of the, in the world, 500 of the 2,000 are in Hawaii. Hawaii has a total area, I imagine very roughly, of the order of the area of Israel, probably less, all the islands combined, and they have 25% of all the species of Drosophila in the world. How come? Well, now we know. Uh, and now with molecular evolution, we can reconstruct the, the, the history. A uh, species uh, was transported, almost certainly by air currents, from Oregon, a few flies, at least a few gravid females, to one of the older islands of Hawaii. And as new islands were formed, these flies, these species were diversifying and migrating to new islands. <coughs> this here says percent, percent endemic. Endemic means that they exist there and nowhere else. So all those 500 species exist nowhere else. Um, 3,750 insect species. Now, that may seem to you like a lot of species. That's a tiny number. We know 700,000 of species of insects, so that's less than one half of one percent, so just about one half of one percent, a small number. That's a characteristic of, the, of these archipelagos, that they have only a few kinds of organisms and the few they have very diversified. Notice that of these 
three, 750 kinds of insects, 15% are just this drosophila, just one kind of insect. Um, and the other ones are a few other kinds, and so on for snails, so from birds, 99% that is all but one of the species of Hawaii are native to Hawaii, nowhere else. So that is demonstration of evolution and also explaining how evolution occurred. And now we have reconstructed in the case of Drosophila flies the, all the migrations that took place and what the species came from somewhere. Darwin didn't get to Hawaii, but got to the Galapagos Islands, which are on the equator, about 600 miles from the country known as Ecuador, from the west coast of Latin America, and he found out that in these islands there were these huge turtles, these tortoises, which do not exist as land turtles anywhere else. There are marine turtles which are very big, and surely this evolved from marine uh, turtles, but um, adapted to different islands, different creatures, different species in different islands. Darwin was fascinated that the Spanish sailors could tell him from which island a particular tortoise came from. Incidentally, Galapagos, the name of the islands, is the name for tortoise in Spanish. The Spaniards who discovered the Galapagos Islands have called them Galapagos for their reasons. Uh, for their reason. Famously, he studied Darwin's finches, of which there is only one species in Western South America, and there are a great diversity of them in the various islands, and using different kinds of food, different ways of adaptation. And we know now when the um, Galapagos Islands were formed, starting about four and a half million years ago. And we know when the different finches species originated, when they evolved. Um, let me just dedicate the last few minutes to this question of intelligent design. It is not, a, I think, a vivid question as, as, a, as a extreme here in Israel as it is in the United States. But um, don't be surprised if it comes in. Um, I, it, it has come in, but uh, it's going to become aggravated more and more. It's amazing just in the last decade or so how much it has become an issue in, in England that was not a few years ago. So they say that the way to explain the diversities and adaptations of organisms is the sign, intelligent design, that is an intelligent agent that is the author of the design. The argument of William Paley formulated in, in a way by one of the current authors of intelligent design in a way very similar as Paley. But the, the point that I am going to make in just a few minutes is the intelligent design critique of evolution is wrong. They argue that the evolution by natural selection is not a satisfactory theory. Second, that intelligent design is not science, contrary to what they argue. And then I will argue what is most shocking when I give these lectures to seminaries and to religious groups, is that natural selection, evolution by natural selection, is compatible with religion with monotheistic religion, like Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, but the intelligent design is not. So they, these are people who are arguing for intelligent design because they think they're doing something good for religion and for God. I hope to convince you in a few minutes that it is not. It implies that God is incompetent, incompetent is cruel, it amounts to blasphemy. Well, we, we, Michael Behe is the only bona fide biologist among proponents of intelligent design. He's not an evolutionist, he's a biochemist, but he says that we know when there is intelligent design, when there is the purposeful arrangement of parts. The same argument as Paley, you know, you have a, a, you have a functioning eye, you need the lens and the cornea and the muscle and the, and the retina and the uh, optical nerve unless you have all the parts together, it doesn't function. Well, Behe knows that Paley didn't know his natural selection. And what Behe argues is that natural selection cannot explain uh, evolution of the sign because 
natural selection operates by changing a little bit at a time, but say the human eye, unless you have all the parts at the same time, is not going to work. So, uh, therefore, it has not come. It cannot come about by natural selection. He uses mostly other examples, particularly molecular examples. But let me look at the eye and the fact that we have, as I have pointed out before, all these parts. Could the eye have come about gradually, one part at a time? And the answer is yes. And in fact, we do not need to go to the fossil record to see the evolution of the eye. We have the mollusks, snails, clams, oysters, and squids, which is a group of animals much older than the, the, animal, the, the vertebrates to which we belong. They have been around for very long, and they have been diversifying for very long, and we can see there the evolution of the eye very quickly. The eye of something called a limpet, I don't know there are limpets in Israel, in the coast of California. We have lots of them, just a few cells, which allow it to be sensitive, perceived whether it's light or not. That is, whether the, the, the um, tide is over them or not. If the tide is over them, they attach themselves to the rock. If the tide is, is low tide, then there is, which they, see, they know because there is light, then they can start to move around and, and grazing. Um, I have to interrupt for one moment. Do you mind moving that handbag far away? You see, what happens is I was charging my iPhone, courtesy of Dr. Rathan, and obviously the timing system has changed. It's there in my, in my, <laughs> uh, my bag. I am sorry for that. And, of course, it's a very persistent uh, iPhone because it's used to wake me up when I have 9 or 10 or 11, 10 hours in this case, difference in my biological clock from California to Israel. So it keeps ringing until I stop it. Well, I cannot stop it now. I apologize for not having anticipated the problem. So here you have the eye of a, um, a, something called a slit shell. This is a mollusk that's used as a delicacy in Spain. I don't know what is used here. It is not known in the United States except in some gourmet areas. Here, Nautilus, a, a snail which lives in the open ocean, which Darwin had pointed out that for many millions of years it had not changed. And here we have now a little more complex eye. It has what eventually will become a retina, more pigmented cells, nerve fibers, then another marine snail with a more elaborate eye, already a lens and something which is becoming, going to become the cornea, and finally the octopus or the squids, which have eyes as complex as ours, you know, what is called a camera eye, but they don't have the effect that we do, because in the evolution of the vertebrates, the fibers connect in the, the retina cells were forming the inside. The, the optic nerve forms in the inside has to cross the retina to go to the brain, so we have a blind spot. Octopus and squids don't have that problem, which is proved definitive according to the proponents of intelligent design, or should be that God loves squids and octopuses more than he loves humans. Well, here you have these five. Um, well, recently, we have a trial in the United States, and if a judge who is an evangelical Christian appointed by President Bush, so not a liberal, in the trial decided the ID movement misrepresents the status of the theory of evolution. It is they argue the theory of evolution is not convincing. He says it is. I will say it is not science because it cannot be tested. There is no any evidence. Uh, a little more than 10 years ago, one of the most visible proponents of intelligent design, Philip Johnson, said, well, we don't have any evidence for intelligent design yet. Give us five years, 10 years. You will see experiments that evolutionists have not even dreamed of. Uh, well, five years went by, 10 years went by. There's not a single bit of evidence, uh, scientific evidence for intelligent design. 
And finally, it's contrary to religion because the design of organisms is imperfect. Our human jaw is not big enough for the teeth. So we have to remove the wisdom teeth, and then we have to go to the orthodontist to have the others straightened. Any engineer that would have designed the human jaw will be fired the next day. And they want to blame God for that. Well, the human birth canal, you know, the, the issue there, that the head is too large for the birth canal. That happened because when the brain started to evolve in the last two million years, it was very fast. So the birth canal of humans has not adapted to the tremendous increase in size of the head. The jaw become, became smaller was one of the adaptations which occurred, which is why we have the problem with the wisdom teeth. But still the head was too large, and then we have the problem that many, many thousands or millions of children have died in history and, and mothers because of that problem. And then, you know, why to use the same bones, organize the same way for writing, for running, for swimming, or for flying, as I was showing you before? It doesn't make any sense. Engineers don't do the things that way. They don't design ships and, and, and boats and, and cars and airplanes for the same parts and the same materials. They start from scratch with new materials suited for the purpose. So I think that um, this, the implications of intelligent designers are that God is incompetent. And ultimately, uh, that if we have designed, we have been designed by God, somehow God would be responsible for all the bad things that happen, including the death of all those innocent children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is time for questions? Yes. Hi. Can you go into detail a little bit about brain evolution? You talked about how up until a certain point the brain didn't grow, and then after that it grew at several times. What were the factors that kept it from growing before, and why did it grow then? Well, the best uh, model or the best explanation that we have and which uh, most paleoanthropologists and evolutions, evolutions agree with is that bipedalism came about first, mostly when our ancestors left the forest and started to live in the savanna, where standing was at an advantage because you could see in the forest that doesn't help you very much. And that as a consequence, left the four limbs free from the need for walking and for jumping from branch to branch of trees. And then the human hand evolved tremendously. You know, we have a very large opposing thumb, which allows us to handle objects. And also we have great sensitivity for, for temperature, surface, and other things. And eventually, at some point, because of the ability of the, of the hands, um, to do so, they started to make tools. And making tools proved to be very advantageous to our ancestors. So homo habilis are called homo habilis because they are the first ones which are associated with tools. You know, they are able or uh, uh, humans. Um, they, and, and because that was so advantageous, um, they were the, uh, the proliferated more, what, does, what is needed to make tools? Advanced intelligence. To make a tool, you have to form mental images of objects that are not present. What use you are going to make of the tool? The tool is for some purpose, a knife for cutting, a, 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 a something, an arrow for, for killing uh, or for hunting. So they started to make tools. Those who have a larger brain who are a little more intelligent, made better tools, and therefore the brain increased, and, and then you start to have a, a, a positive feedback loop, better tools, larger brain. So there's, there's an explanation that, you know, it's very difficult to test. It's, um, we may find ways to test it. Never say, uh, not put limits to science, you know. 
uh, but, the, but it's the one that makes m most sense among the current explanations. I'll start with a comment. Uh, you can be happy. We have appointed as a horse in the Senate, uh, the chief scientist of the Ministry of Education, uh, just as much as Bush appointed uh, the similar scientist in his uh, administration. So we can be proud of ourselves and you can be proud of us. But the question is, uh, continuing the uh, question of this lady, uh, when do you suppose the uh, uh, form of speech, the, uh, the um, property of speaking evolved and uh, do you think it uh, may have uh, effect on the size of the brain and uh, do you think uh, the, uh, our ability to listen to music has anything to do with uh, speech as well? Yes. Well, first of all, I will not comment in the appointment of your minister because I'm profiting here as a, as a foreigner from the hospitality of this country, so I will not comment on that subject. I could comment a lot about Bush, but perhaps it's not necessary. Um, yeah, you see, it comes back. <laughs> Maybe I can, you bring me the handbag, I can turn it off in a moment. I know how my phone works. Um, Moreover, he's using all the battery that I was sharing in, in the office of professor. <laughs> uh, rather, anyway, Nathan. Uh, the, the language, articulate language as the one we have, requires several things. One of them is very advanced brain, a very advanced intelligence, also changes in the vocal cords and many others, which are very different for us than they are for the chimpanzee or the gorilla. So even the chimpanzees were smart enough to speak, they could not articulate orally the vocabulary or, or language. Um, when language came, is a matter of active investigation. Uh, I've written some about it recently. Um, the short answer is that we don't know. It certainly requires an advanced intelligence, very advanced intelligence. You think about the requirements of articulate language. There are sort of two prevailing theories, and both of them argue that, that language evolved very recently. One that places the origin of spoken language, and eventually, of course, written language, about 60,000 years ago, and the other one which places it much more recently in, in, at the end of the last glaciation that was the most severe that peaked about 16,000 years ago, so in the last 15 or 14 thousand years, one can have evidence for one and the other, but in almost all cases, many evolutionists, including myself, believe that it is closely linked to the evolution of aesthetic perception and also of morality, the evolution of morality. So I think there are very good reasons to link uh, aesthetics, as you suggested, and language. What for me is missing is the transfer from, say, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen into these sophisticated uh, animals and up to, the, uh, up to a human being. So we know that by lightning and thunder, you generate shock waves that can produce from these molecules ammonia, ethane, and so on, and maybe fractions of amino acids. But what was the need to produce, say, animals. I agree that the evolution, when you have an animal, it will go by evolution probably to human beings, to horses or whatever. But the period of time that is needed to transfer these molecules into something that will resemble animal or whatever is, I don't know, hundreds of millions of years. You probably know the book of uh, um, what's his name, I forgot, Childhood Ends, Clark, that he convinced, at least convinced me, that the period of time that you go from these atoms or molecules into, I'm not saying human beings, but animals, is much more than okay. what we have. 
Yes. And well, this is somewhat a science fiction, and he believes that there was some intervention of some force from outside. But uh, can you yeah. explain okay. to me yeah. what was yeah. the need of this molecule to produce yeah. this? Uh, yeah. Of course, first to uh, clarify language, there is no need. This is happened, come about. Uh, but the universe came about by current estimates something like 15 billion years ago. The Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. I'm talking English billions. Is that also here also thousand million? Because if one I'm most of Europe, in, you, you say billions means a million million, not a thousand million. Anyway, so 4,500 4, million years ago, the Earth formed. Life, we trace it to about 3.7 thousand million years. Now, animals come about somewhere about 700 million years. So only one-fifth of the time since life has existed. So we, have, we had 3,000 million of year of years of evolution forming all kinds of organisms, all microscopic, very diversified, until finally the first uh, multicellular organisms start to form with many cells and then they start to differentiate. It turns out that going from single cell algae that we know to multicellular algae that are related to them, it takes only five mutations. So now we know how to go from something very simple to something very complex. We don't have a very good history of, or, or theory of how life originated, but that um, has um, entered now into the field of experimental biology and a lot of many discoveries are being made which I think will require more than a few words for me to explain but the fundamental problem with the origin of life um, is not how complex molecules are formed because there are many ways in which they can form. The fundamental problem is how you have two kinds of molecules at the same time one which carries information, the DNA, and the other one which is the machinery to reproduce the information, which are the proteins and enzymes. It's, so you need a computer and you need the software both at the same time. So this is the fundamental problem. And now they have been, some molecules have been discor discovered, they earned to young people, to Nobel Prizes, that can function both as information molecules and as enzymes, they're called ribosomes. So there's one way in which current uh, theories about the uh, origin of life go. Well, there is much more to go, but I think that the uh, problem of the origin of life, I, I think it will be solved, like uh, all issues in science eventually, um, but um, there has been no very active, extended research in that problem, except a few essays in the first half of the 20th century until very recent years when experimental science has come into play in trying to discover, to discover the origin of life. There's in principle nothing fundamentally um, impossible there. It's just that you have to find the actual process by which, by which things happen. Well, the last time I visited Mars, <laughs> uh, almost certainly there is no life within the solar system. The best chances were for Mars, and um, 10 years ago, some scientists, uh, distinguished scientists, from particularly a, a, a distinguished uh, organic chemistry from Stanford, he thought he had identified some primitive forms of life there. there it's not there. And uh, so most likely there's no life on Earth, uh, and, I mean on, on, on the solar system. I'm getting distracted because I'm thinking now of other Earths. There are 100,000 million, 100 uh, billion stars in our galaxy. Many of them we know now have planets. So 100,000 million stars is a lot. How many planets may be there they have conditions favorable to life? We don't know, but it stands to reason that there are more than a few. 
And if there are conditions favorable to life, probably life has evolved. But it probably will look very different from life on Earth because it starts from different beginnings. It's like languages. You start one language completely independent from other, completely, completely independent. They're not going to be similar in any respect. Uh, as a professor from the University of California, are there, is there still in the United States in the school system attempts made to stop teaching evolution in the, uh, according to its various states, especially where a, a lot of the fundamentalist Christians live who, who take the Bible literally? And uh, there, there seems to be, it comes up uh, in the news every year or so, some school board is trying to take out the teaching of evolution in the uh, school systems. And then some of us have to spend a lot of time uh, challenging them in the courts, because in the United States you cannot teach anything which is fundamentally religious as part of the science courses. I mean, you can teach intelligent design of creation in classes about the history of religions or whatever, but not in science, so we have to go through this process. And again and again, the courts in the United States support science, um, including the case that I was alluding to, one of the most important ones about, what, six years ago in Pennsylvania, for a, a judge who is a fundamentally Christian, an evangelical Christian, appointed by Bush, and yet when he confronted, was confronted with the evidence, says, Evolution is a very well-established science. Intelligent design is not science, so you cannot teach intelligent design in the schools. This is going to continue in various ways. Um, if you want to be an optimist, and I'm an incorrigible optimist, uh, it has some advantage. That it is, we are, some of us invited all the time in public forums all organizations of all sorts, literary, history, religious seminaries, churches, you will be surprised the number of churches would invite me to give talks, which allow us to explain science and therefore educate the public about science, all because of this conflict. So it has some side benefit that a very optimistic person like myself can see, but it is in a way a disgrace that they keep repeating arguments that, that uh, uh, you know, have no validity. And what to me is a disgrace is that we have five or six authors, there are not many more, five or six authors who keep writing books about defending intelligent design. These are intelligent people. And in some cases, they know that what they are arguing is not correct. But those books sell. I, I think this, this is very unfortunate. Thank you. Oh, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.